Hey everyone, it's Jim and Charles from Vowels and More, an online vintage tube store. And today in Tube Lab number 193, we're going to revisit how to clean two pins. But first, caution everyone, electronics and tube amplifiers can have very high voltages present, which can be lethal. Always exercise extreme caution when working around them and consult a professional technician if in doubt. Well, there, in the last year, there have been a lot of new customers uh, to the store. New subscribers on the channel. Uh, and um, people, basically, who are getting into tube amps for the first time. And I, one of the most common problems they're going to come across is contact issues or uh, scratchy or white noise-like sounds from their tube system. And you can pretty much presume you have a bad connection somewhere. Now, this could be a cable connection. That would be a very common problem. Or a pin connection. Simply removing the tube or cable and reinstalling will probably fix the problem for a little while. But to really fix it, the contact surfaces need to be cleaned. Even a contact surface that looks clean may well be contaminated, causing conductivity problems. That's just a big fancy word for the connections not to any damn good. <laughs> so anyways, we're going to revisit this um, for everybody who's new to tubes and we're probably got some new tricks for those of you who watched, I think I did a video years ago. Anyways, it's a refresher for everybody. Um, and I've got out here a bunch of the standard cleaning things that we use cleaning products. So here's a set of brushes. There's a nylon brush, a brass brush, and a stainless steel brush. And this is the least aggressive. This is medium. This is heavier. We've got a, um, a double wheel for our Dremel. And in fact, before I go too far, let me get out a tray of them. You buy them as kits. And they are really designed um, Charles actually found these, um, and they really changed how we cleaned um, a lot of different surfaces. Well, before those, we were using a wire wheel that had bristles like this on it, and it worked just fine, to be fair. It worked but, brilliantly, but the little bristles came flying all over the oh, place. Oh, and they like to get stuck in socks, stuck in feet. Well, and... your toes in particular. <laughs> yeah. Why do mosquitoes and little shards of metal like your uh, toes? They, they just love stabbing me, I guess. <laughs> yeah. So anyways, they come in kits. Uh, the, the way these kits are designed is that you put one disc on, but... We've found that if you double disc them, that, um, that it works much, much better. And also, the, the lower the grit, the more abrasive it is, the, the better it tends to be. Somewhere around the 120 grit range seems to work best, which is what these dark blue ones are. Right. Um, and no matter what you do, you don't want too aggressive um, a, a cleaning solution. So always start with something light. So let's start... And over here, I've got um, some deoxit, and we'll talk about that in a minute when we use it. I have some sample, you know, uh, cleaning implements and sockets, and we'll just go through everything one step at a time. So, starting with something that is got gold-plated pins, and this cannot take a heavy abrasive cleaner of any kind whatsoever. There is not a lot of gold on those pins. No. <laughs> No. So, if they are reasonably clean, um, really, um, a little bit of uh, isopropyl alcohol. Hang on a second. I've got I always. We have tons of this on the bench. So, a little bit of 99% isopropyl alcohol is probably safe. It'll all depend on what the binder is. If there is a binder on the. Um, on the little thin layer of gold plating. Underneath the gold plating, there's gonna be a, a, a brass pin, most likely. Mm -hmm. So possibly you could try a little isopropyl like this and just clean them off. There shouldn't be an oxide layer that's really stuck to it though. No, the that's... worst, you're gonna have some some dirt, some grime, uh, maybe, uh, maybe they got wet at some point, there's just a little bit of residue stuck on there. That's right, so we're not talking about a tarnished gold layer, we're talking about 
um, a contaminant on top of the gold. Yeah. So what I would probably do is start off with something like a small nylon brush and just very gently give it a little, a little knock off. You could try a little bit of isopropyl and see how that goes. Always do a little test spot before you go any further with something you're not 100% sure of. Um, there is a deoxid uh, contact uh, surface. I think it's called deoxid gold um, that I've got somewhere on my bench, but I, I don't see it here. Uh, that's meant uh, to help enhance oh. gold contacts. There we go. Oh, there's the gold. Yeah. Yeah. So, anyways. So this is going to take the absolute least attention. You may not do anything to these whatsoever. If you see any signs of the gold layer starting to uh, peel off or separate, I wouldn't even touch them, to be honest with you. And that's very common, unfortunately. Um, you also have to watch with some modern production tubes, too, that have a, a gold coating on them because they aren't to spec on the actual diameter of the pins. They're actually much thicker. I can't remember the exact brand that does this, but they're fairly common and they are hard to insert in a normal nine pin socket. They, you can, you have a chance of bending the pins, so be extremely careful with those tubes. Right. Okay, what about um, a, a really nice uh, tube that has a, a tin plated uh, brass pin? Well, again, you don't really want to be aggressive with that surface. If it's nice and clean and shiny like this, you might just knock it off with this. You might clean it with a little isopropyl. But generally speaking, if it's bright and shiny and nobody has put their fingers all over it, um, it's probably perfectly good to go. So it should be okay. Um, so but treat it like the gold, basically. Treat it like the gold, basically. Um, you can be a little bit more aggressive with the tin coating. It bonds much, much better um, to the brass pin stock. Now, the vast majority of miniature nine pins are basically a brass pin of some kind, some alloy, and they they will tarnish readily. Even a new old stock tube uh, will tarnish readily over time, um, and that's not a sign of a defect. It just it it'll oxidize in oxygen, and uh, the metallurgy of the pin may well contribute to the oxidization. So, with that, you want to be a little more aggressive. So. If you don't have a Dremel tool, you could start with the brass. Can you go grab the, the knife, Charles? Yep. You could start with the brass brush. Look at how fast that cleans that up. And that's going to be a good low uh, impact method. Uh, we carry the brushes in the store, by the way, mostly just as a matter of convenience in case somebody just can't find them locally. Um, they're really common brushes. They're, they're really common. They're actually, the, these brushes, the set, are made for uh, cleaning gas burner rings. Um, that's what they're designed for, but they're great for all sorts of things. So the stainless steel brush will be much, much more aggressive, and it'll take off the bad material quite quickly. Now, um, if you've got a lot of corrosion, you can take, you see the low angle approach of this blade? That um, is a less common type of blade in a box knife, but it's all we have on our benches because they can get into really tight spots. And this is a very good method. You can just essentially scrape the pin surface. You want to get in and around that corner and just carefully scrape and go all the way around once and then actually just turn it around and then come back in like this and just keep scraping and that'll make for a very, very clean, it's, it's, a, it's basically a scraped abrasive uh, surface, but you'll be able to clean that up really quite quickly. Now on our benches, we use uh, Dremels with wheels, as I mentioned earlier, and I'll show you how fast that is. Charles will probably mute the sound, it's gonna get loud. Look at that. Now, if the pins are sturdy, not all pins are sturdy, you can do this. Now, caution everyone, if you've got wimpy pins, and some of them are, 
You can't go sideways with the Dremel or you'll rip the pin right off. So be really careful. The other thing too is when these are brand new and you load them, you've got to break them in if you're going to try that trick. Otherwise, they're just way too stiff and they won't, they won't wrap around safely around, um, around the pin without ripping it to shreds. Now, after you do that, you really have to use a pin straightener. You've got to have a pin straightener. If you're doing any kind of tube uh, uh, pin cleaning, a straightener, any sort of straightener is essential. We've got them on our benches. Unfortunately, we don't sell them yet, and there aren't a lot of options out there for them either. They're not a common tool anymore, but uh, we they might have to change that. They show up as a vintage, um, as a vintage tool every once in a while. Um, I got lucky. I found mine in a big, you know, a big uh, pile of tubes that I bought. So. Um, years and years ago and I'm so grateful for the pattern that I found. Anyways, now um, what about bigger tubes? Well, we've got a selection of them. So here is um, an 807 I think. It's got five pins and it's got a top cap. So with this you could you could go after it with the with the brush just just like um, a small tube but you're going to be a little bit more aggressive. You could go after it with the Dremel, which is what we would do. And, um, and that would make fairly quick work of it. What about the top cap on here? Well, that's your high voltage B plus plate connection. Yeah. Um, and if there's two of these, most likely one is the grid and one is the plate. In this case, most cases that the, if there's a single, um, uh, top cap connection. It's going to be the high voltage connection. And that you got to be careful of because these are glued to the glass and slightly crimped to it and soldered through here. And you don't want to loosen that up. You can put a little bit of crazy glue underneath to glue it back on. Um, but you, it's, it's a delicate operation. So you got to be gentle. So you can come in like this. Now, you can't really tell, but I wasn't putting any pressure on this at all because I don't, I don't want the wheel to bite hard. I just want it to touch it, basically. If, if you're new to this, I would be inclined to just go at it and take your time and just, and just brush it until it's bright. But you're not scrubbing a, a grubby bathroom or something like that. You're just lightly going after it with the brush. How would you know? You don't clean, you don't clean our bathroom. Uh, I, I seem to remember scrubbing a certain tub recently. Oh, that's true. You helped. Yeah, you helped. That's right. Charles is, is both the brains and the muscles of the operation. So, um, yeah. So, clean your, anything that's going to have an electrical connection needs to be clean. So, the top caps, yeah. What about a, a, a typical octal tube? Here, I think, is a, a dead EO34. And it's got really awful looking pins. They're, they've got wear on them. You can see where they were actually in the socket. And they are fairly heavily oxidized. Let's see what we can do with those. So you see how quickly they can clean up and now you may have uh, recently bought um, or found um, a new old stock uh, bunch of uh, octal tubes and they might be new in the box and but you you pull them out and the pins look like this. So is that a sign of a defect? No, it's not. It's, it's just normal oxidization. Even in a cardboard box, there is envir the environment of the storage area is moving in and out of that box on a fairly uh, 
regular basis. If the storage area is anywhere near the ocean, within a couple of miles or a couple of kilometers, um, you're going to have some uh, corrosive uh, salt in the air moving around, mm -hmm. and it'll make these even go green. So that can happen for a brand new tube, brand, you know, in the box, a new tube in the case. We see it all the time. And um, tubes that we ship out, we clean the pins just before shipping. Even if the pins were cleaned for, for testing, for testing, even if they were, you know, just cleaned a month ago, when we ship a tube and we normally have it on a lab bench and we normally have a good look at it and we make sure to clean it up. Um, but that does not mean that your two pins are going to be clean forever. It just means that they're clean until they start oxidizing again or picking up a little bit of dirt from the environment. You know, um, even uh, if you do a lot of cooking in the household and your listening room is only one room away, um, then you're going to have a little bit of, uh, of, of grease moving around in the air. Um, humidity changes back and forth, uh, all sorts of things can happen. So if you've got a little bit of a, of a noise or a poor contact, just pull the tubes, of course, make everything safe first and give them a good clean. What about the sockets? So that's basically the other half of the equation, right? So here's a standard octal socket that we use actually in our kit amps. These are brilliant. There's ceramic. They have this, um, this, I don't know if you can see it, but it's got we're kind of out of focus here. See, if Let me get it over here. Ah, there we go. It's got a, like a split claw. So what happens is, is when the pin, when the socket, <laughs> when the tube is inserted, the, the pin actually has to sort of get scratched as it opens up that claw, just like this. So you almost get a fresh surface every time for the contact. Yeah, it sort of cuts into it as it, as it bites, as it receives it. And these last forever, so th these are really great. Um, now, but it doesn't matter uh, how good your socket design is or the quality of the metallurgy, eventually it's going to get, um, it's going to get a little bit of uh, surface corrosion and dirt and gunk on it and it'll need to be cleaned. So. With something like this, you'd never want to go in with something like this giant Q-tip. It's just going to make a complete mess of it, and it's going to leave debris behind. So there are some really specialized kinds of tips that you can get your hands on. And really what you want is to use um, one of the deoxid, one of the red deoxids. You could spray it in, but I don't recommend that. This is really good for... Um, for volume pots and things like that, uh, controls that need that you need to get into a case through a hole. This is really brilliant for a bigger quantity. Um, and here is just a small version of this with a little brush. Uh, let me just open it up and show you. And this is all that most people would need in a home setting. Oh, this, uh, this will, would last a long time. This would last forever. Yeah. Um, and these are actually sold as. Um, as sample kits. So you buy a, a set of, I think, five of them. They're not cheap, but they're really worthwhile. So what you would do is just put a little dab of deoxid in here and just leave it. Go away, have a coffee, and then come back with this. You can put a little bit of deoxid on here. Here, let's just do that so you see how it's done. Just load a little tiny bit of deoxid. You don't need a lot. A little bit gets you a long, long way. And then you would just work that in like this. You just work it in like this. Just keep cleaning. Same goes for a little miniature nine pin. Something like this tool will get in there. So you would put a little drop of your deoxid into each one of the receivers. Let me repeat that. A little drop. That's all you want to do. You don't want to be pouring this stuff into your amplifier. That's one of the reasons why I don't like the spray for small jobs. It's overkill. <laughs> it's, it's way overkill. You could actually make a really serious mess um, if you don't show restraint. That's why this, this little brush in the, the bottle is fabulous. Um, in fact, this is all I use for years and years and years. Um, an idle file friend of mine brought me over a sample pack one day and he said, here, this is what you need. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
and uh, I think I'm on my second or third sample pack. Anyways, um, so just get in there as best you can and just clean that up. The nice thing about deoxid is if you have a little bit of residue left over, that's just perfectly fine. Uh, and in many cases, they actually recommend that you just leave a very small film of deoxid on your contact surface. And I think in the multi-pack, they actually have a specific uh, vial of um, like a contact treatment, I believe, that's meant to be left on. Yeah, possibly. I mean, a lot of the deoxids share a lot of, I think, um, chemical commonality. So they have specialized formulas for this and that. And it's nice to have the right product, but... Yeah. But if this is all you can find, this is all you need, really. Yeah. Well, for uh, for sockets, this is really the 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 correct product um, to be using. Um, if you're doing something like a plastic fader or something like that, then you need a really specific uh, fader cleaner because you don't want to do any damage to um, a, a plastic slider or something like that. Okay. So I think we've covered pretty much everything. Now, um, when, when you clean um, your tubes, do it in you know, a careful, logical way. Uh, unplug your amp. Um, take your tubes out cold. You don't want to be working with hot tubes. Set yourself up on a nice big work area with a cloth that won't allow the tubes to easily roll around and tackle one tube at a time. And just, when we're cleaning orders for customers, we start with one tube on one side of the bench, it moves to the other side of the bench. Usually in a bin on both sides, so they can't roll a, around or go anywhere. Yeah, we've got, we have the tower of bins. Here's, here's one of them just sitting here. Ah, it's a dirty bin. Let's get it off the show. <laughs> Anyways, they get dirty. Um, then we'll have little bins, little tubs, and that way, you you know, you don't want to do any more damage to your tubes um, than they already have to their pins. In fact, that is the rule when you put something on the bench is do no harm. Do no harm. <laughs> yeah. And back to safety with the tubes, if you're going to uh, clean out your sockets on your amplifier, make sure you've turned it off and you've given it enough time to fully discharge its capacitors. Sometimes this can be up to 24 hours afterwards, so if you're going to clean them up, shut it off, leave it for a day, and come back to it. Yeah, I mean, the, most amps, not every amp, but most amps, the quickest way to discharge um, the capacitors inside the amp is to simply leave the tubes in place. So turn it off and walk away from it, and the tubes will help uh, to discharge the power that's residing inside the, the, the capacitors in most cases. It's not a guarantee. Yeah, so, so. if you want to be 100% safe, just leave it for a good long while. Yeah. Okay, well, hopefully that helps everyone, and hopefully that reduces some of those little scratchy, um, uh, intermittent little noises that you hear. I would say that uh, in our systems, tubes are roughly, tube contact issues are roughly half the cause of those kinds of noises. The other half are the cables, the cable connections. And uh, that's... For all the same reasons. For all the same reasons. Um, but that's, that's for another episode. Okay, Charles. Well, what did you get in this week? I don't think it's been that busy, but we do have a huge order coming in. We do. So let's clear the decks and take a look at what you found. Okay, well, we were lucky enough that we managed to find a partial case of these absolutely beautiful 807 tubes. These are beam tetrodes, I think. Beam powered tetrodes. And they're kind of like the classic power transmitting tube, but it's also used in a lot of hi-fi systems. So this is kind of like a 6L6 with a top cap in its specs and its usage. And let me see if I can get that logo there on screen. There we go. These are beautiful examples from 1978, and they were made in the uh, Ulyanovsk. Is that how it's pronounced? Ulyanov plant. Ulyanov. That's in it. Ulyanovsk. <laughs> yeah, I always get those confused. Which is, I think, just southeast of uh, Moscow. Mm -hmm. and, and its claim to fame, I think, is it's the birthplace of Lenin. Yeah. And these, uh, and the factory was known for making very high-quality military tubes. And, and in fact. 
that factory makes our GU50 tube that we are in love with. And the 6P7S, which is actually a very similar tube to this one, just slightly lower powered and of course an octal base on it. Both of them that we use in our monoblock kits. Yeah. So this one caught our interest here. Um, they're, they're absolutely beautifully made tubes. Let's just rotate it slowly. Everybody likes the slow rotate on the tubes. And these are very, very similar in construction to the North American equivalents, of course, because the Soviet Union got a lot of material supply and support for World War II, and these are the transmitting tubes that would have been getting used at that time. So if you look at a, a vintage RCA 807, it's almost identical. There's some minor differences in the plate and the construction, but you can clearly tell they're related. And this is a power tube that was used by... Um developers at home um, um, who were looking for something available and affordable and high powered um, way back in the 1950s and 60s. Um, it's pretty much out of favor these days. Most people uh, will work with different tubes, but that doesn't negate the fact that it's a great tube to be working with. In fact, we have um, a prototype monoblock that'll be part of our modern line that we're working on. Whether it actually gets past the prototype stage or not, I don't know. It's still very early stages, but it's looking very promising at the moment. And uh, we're hoping to use these tubes in it. Yeah, and of course we'll be running them in Class A, but um, a lot of developers would be running it in Class AB. I'm not a huge fan of Class AB. I, uh, sonic, the purity of the sound, um, a nice clean presentation is what we're all about as audiophiles and um, and we don't need a lot of power in our system so something that's 8 or 10 watts um, in any sort of reasonably efficient speaker system wow it's you can get loud real fast <laughs> yeah yep. so these are in the store right now we got a bunch of them new old stock in and we at the same time went through what we have for other 807 types they're not in the store yet but they're going to be getting added over the next couple of days maybe a week depending on how busy we are with development and so if you've got an 807 amp out there and you're interested in rolling some tubes we've got some great options for you yeah okay well thanks for that charles and if you stay to the very end Here's some discount codes to help you out. Uh, we can reach most people with flat rate $20 shipping. Um, we do have problems with some uh, difficult to ship areas. The Philippines is one of them. If you are in an area in which uh, your postal service didn't sign on to the International Postal Union Agreement or is known to be an area prone to theft, you should contact us before we try to ship to you because we always try to ship with tracking. But and oftentimes tracking is very prohibitively expensive to these places. Or not available whatsoever. And that, according to my postmaster, when tracking is not commonly available or extremely expensive, uh, you know, a small parcel is 80 bucks to ship, um, which basically means they put somebody on an airplane with your box in their lap. <laughs> um, if that's the case, that's a big indication that there's a problem within the postal system. So theft is a problem. Um, and as a result, uh, just give us a call and send us, a, send us a note through the contact in the store and we'll see what we can do as far as getting the parcel to you. But in most cases, the solution is a reshipper. So a lot of people in difficult to ship regions will have a reshipper in the United States or in Canada, but in the U.S. is where they're normally located. And what they'll do is they'll put a larger parcel together and use a proper courier, um, you know, a bonded courier with signature at the other end. That's ideal. Um, but small orders, obviously, we can't, that nobody can afford to use um, a, you know, a courier like that. So anyways, if your order is $150 or more after discount, the shipping will be on us, folks. And there's a bunch of discounts that you can use. And somebody, in fact, a whole bunch of people have been grabbing a secret code that I gave away too much the other day. <laughs> and that's great because that means you're watching the videos and you're paying attention. And um, it always warms my heart when when people grab a cheers code. Stay safe, everyone. This is Jim. And Charles. Signing off. Cheers, everyone. <laughs>